So the uh, basic plan for today, Lord Welling, um, is that we'll be addressing paragraphs 8 and 9 um, of the Confession, chapter 26 of the Church. Um, but uh, before we do that, I just want to do an extremely ultra mega super duper brief review of everything we talked about so far. <laughs> um, you say that one more time. <laughs> I don't even remember what words I even used. Mega brief review of everything we've talked about. Nice. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> so up to this point, we kind of talked about. Um, several things regarding the church. We talked about the universal churches, um, church, uh, which is, you know, paragraphs is one, two, three, and, you know, four, talking about the Christ headship of the church, the universal <laughs> church. And that pretty much how all those who have been saved by God, the elect of God, are part of that universal church. And yet, at the same time, that universal church is not, um, you know, the, we, there's a phrase used, invisible church, which in one sense can be used, and yet the biblical teaching is that that invisible universal church does not stay invisible, invisible. But God has fashioned it so that it comes forth apparent. It is visible that the people, those who have been truly saved of God, profess the name of Christ, and they gather together as visible churches. <clears throat> and as Joel uh, did a pretty good job on uh, ch uh, chapter, I mean, paragraph four, uh, well, how Christ is the head of the church and all that entails, and how any system that tries to proclaim any other master, any other Lord above the church, such as the Antichrist, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> <Pretty slow off>. <laughs> <laughs> possibly. Uh, well, the Pope is a Antichrist in one sense, yes. Uh, but yes, but any like systems like the, like the Popish um, regime, the uh, whole system of it is um, uh, against the Lordship of Christ and all that entails. <coughs> yes, mess up my words. That's okay. And as uh, Nick. Uh, kind of touched on uh, last week, um, introducing uh, the topic of the local church, focusing now from the universal church down to the visible body, um, with paragraphs five to seven, um, we, we talked about how all those who God um, has elected and has called out into salvation through Christ and by the Spirit are called to gather as a local body. And that, um, it's only those who are visible saints who are, make up that, vis that visible body. Uh, so only those who are professing and those who have been baptized and all of that entails. <coughs> uh, contra other systems like the Presbyterian with system with their um, infant baptism um, and other perspectives that they have. Um, and from, with that, there's the, also the idea of the fact that in paragraph 7 that the church, the local church, has all the authority that uh, God has supplied to it. Or, or to rephrase it in another way, um, all that the church needs, God has given to the local body, and that there is no other higher hierarchy besides the Lord Jesus Christ. There, is, there aren't synods, there aren't um, bishops, there aren't a presbytery group of men who are above the church, but all the authority is found in each individual local church with the members and the officers of it. Um, did I miss anything important details? Is that, okay, that's about it? Totally For a super brief review? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so as we uh, go on to uh, paragraphs eight and nine today, um, I wanted to like introduce some questions. Uh, not that I'm asking for answers right now, but sort of as questions that were kind of sort of answering in one way or another throughout uh, today's lesson. That is, um, you know, so if, if, <clears throat> if all the authority, if the authority has been given to the local church, how does that local church look like? What, what is it made up of? Uh, you know, what's the authority structure, let's put it, what is the government of that local church? And as the confession, as we'll read in, in a second, talks about how there are members 
and there are officers. <coughs> and then the question then becomes, because historically this has been a question of how many officers are there? Um, because certain, certain, certain denominations, certain groups teach that there is, uh, uh, there's, the, there's the layman, then there's the elders, or, and then the presbyteries above them, and then bishops above them, or they, have a, or they make a separation between elders, such as ruling elders, those who rule the church, and teaching elders who rule, but also teach. And obviously one other issue in modern evangelicalism is the relationship between elders and deacons. Um, what's the difference? Uh, are they this, you know, the same thing, but just focusing on you know, different things? Or is there a, a real difference between elders and deacons? Um, <clears throat> and what are their duties? Uh, what about the plural, mess up my word, plurality of elders? You know, how many elders should it be in a church? Um, you know, based on our prayer request, that we've been praying for a long time, that should give a hint about our view. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> um, um, and the other question that becomes, well, if we believe that there should be more than one elder in a church, normally, if the best situation, that's the, the norm is to have more than one elder, um, are there differences between the elders? Is there a senior elder, or in other words, a senior pastor, and then there's you know, assistant pastors who are under them, so it's sort of like a triangle system, triangle py pyramid power scheme thing. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not my words. <clears throat> um, is that the biblical system? Is that the, is that the biblical view that there is a one pastor who rules over the, all the other pastors? Or is it something else? What about, are there... Um, you know, at, at least in, in my experience, maybe your guys' church was a bit different. I don't know. Um, but from, from what I've heard from conversations, probably not. But in, in a lot of churches, you have youth pastors. You know, then you have other offices of a director of, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, ten, add 10 words after that, <laughs> uh, after that phrase. So there's all these questions of, uh, that the modern church faces. And one of the reasons why, honestly, uh, you know, we have these issues is because uh, even though many, uh, many churches may profess sola scriptura, the scripture alone is sufficient for the church, to, for the ruling of the church and the faith of the church, at, um, when it comes to practice, uh, we can easily become pragmatic. Right. Um, um, or at times, or not just that, but maybe may, some you know, may say, well, the New Testament doesn't address it in a proper way. It may give some hints, but that's it. There's no clear details. We can form the church any way we want. Um, uh, but the view of the um, confessional Baptists is that scripture is enough. That the Bible, and especially the New Testament specifically, gives enough details to show us how the church ought to look like in its government. Um, so that's sort of the, um, you know, all these questions, um, which in one way or another, if I don't answer them, I'm sorry, <laughs> indirectly, uh, that we're going to be sort of like addressing one way or another. Um, um, any questions so far about anything I said? Concerns? I'll just, I'll just make a quick comment. Oh yeah, go ahead. Just like you were saying about you know that pragmatism of creating positions that are clearly not there, director of worship, director of like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. it's just it just comes down to an attack on the sufficiency of scripture. What you were saying, Benny, because you're just you're saying that the offices that are described in the Bible aren't enough to say how the church should actually be run. So it really comes back to views of scripture, which is important. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and another question, I didn't, I didn't write it down, but I just remember because it's something we, uh, Lord willing, will address in a sec later on, is the question of um, women in, these, uh, in the role of, op of official positions. Uh, can females be uh, elders, pastors? Uh, that's a very contentious topic these days. Um, and what about deacons? Um, can women be uh, deaconesses? That's the right, that's the word, right? Deaconesses? Deaconess? I think that's the word. Um, 
and all these things. Um, yeah. Well, if that's um, set forth, like, plain, like on the playing field set before us, uh, let us go to the uh, confession then. And uh, Gordon, you're up. <laughs> uh, you can read paragraph 8, uh, chapter 26. A particular church gathered and completely organized according to the mind of Christ consists of officers and members and the officers appointed by Christ to be chosen and set apart by the church, so called and gathered, <coughs> for the peculiar administration of ordinances and execution of power or, or duty, which he entrusts them with or calls them to, to be continued to the end of the world, are bishops or elders and deacons. Mm -hmm. So we see in paragraph 8 that it introduces, um, you know, what you can call the makeup or the, um, what Waldron calls the identity of the church government. Um, how does it look like? And we see the confession makes a um, couple points. First, that there are members of the local church, uh, which in one sense may seem self-explanatory, but you know, it, sh it has to be pointed out. And there are officers who are also members of uh, that same local body. And that the confession makes a point that these officers are appointed by Christ and then called by the church. Um, that's also a very important point because, you know, uh, it isn't as if Christ gave, you know, a free for all, free reign to the people of God saying, you know, there's no um, standards, do whatever you want. I haven't chosen anyone to be officers. You guys are on your own. Rather, Christ has appointed his standard and has appointed his, those men that he desires to be elders or deacons in the local church. Um, and the next paragraph kind of addresses how that's done. Um, that's pretty loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, if we believe that Christ is Lord of the church, as paragraph four, Sorry, I got distracted. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, as paragraph four points out, um, as Joe noted um, two or three weeks ago, uh, the, the Bible teaches Christ is Lord of the church and that as Lord, Christ desires his church to be run in an orderly manner. So um, we should expect Christ to you know, appoint his people, uh, his, those men and to set those standards and that through the Spirit to lead people to see those men um, that God, Christ has chosen and to over time to, for them to be uh, developing and growing in their gifts and all these things and eventually called to the ministry. And that uh, we see finally, um, paragraph eight points out how there's two offices. There is elders or bishops and deacons. That's it, nothing else. Um, and we'll kind of we'll address that a little bit later <coughs> in a second. Um, so we can read, um, well, any questions about paragraph A, what it says? Maybe a wording or anything like that? Okay. Uh, then we can read uh, paragraph 9. Mitch? <coughs> appointed by Christ for the calling of any person fitted and gifted by the Holy Spirit under the office of bishop or elder in a church is that he is chosen thereunto by the common suffrage of the church itself, and solemnly set apart by fasting and prayer, with imposition of hands of the eldership of the church, if there be any before constituated therein, and of a deacon, that he be chosen by the like suffrage and set apart by prayer, and like the imposition of hands. <coughs> so we see that um, as paragraph a points out there's two offices, the bishops, elders, and, uh, and deacons. Um, paragraph 9 then moves on to show how this appointment is to be done. How are uh, the officers to be selected, chosen, and all these things. And there's a couple points. First, again, the, rep the uh, emphasis on the reality that Christ is the one who is appointed the way it should be done. Um, and that it is um, through 
the spirit working in those men that it becomes apparent. Um, and one reason why this is emphasized is because you know, we, if we really believe in the regular principle, then we believe that you know, if Christ said, Christ has shown through the apostles that things are to be done in this way, we better make sure that we actually do that and we don't deviate from it. Because once we start to have our own inventions of you know, how someone should be selected, uh, it, leads that, it leads to a very dangerous grounds and eventually um, very bad ends for those churches. Um, the second thing that the, um, this paragraph points out is that it is by common suffrage. Um, what does that word mean, suffrage? Does it mean suffering? <laughs> by the common suffering of church? Some churches use the common suffering. <laughs> Sadly, yes. It's choosing. Yeah, choosing or voting. Yeah. Um, an older word for it, um, you know, if you, know, if you guys remember from a history class in, um, in high school, high school, middle school, some school, um, you know, you, you, about American um, history, you learn about the women's um, yeah. suffrage movement uh, during the early 20th century and all these things. Same idea. Um, uh, another thing that the um, confession points out is that once these men are seen, that they are set apart by fasting, prayer, and the imposition of hands. Mm. And that's an interesting element. Um, I know, like for me, for me it's for, at least from my own experience, um, that's sort of the norm, the imposition of hands, because like uh, in my church background, it's sort of like, yeah, of course you put, lay, lay, in, lay hands on the men you're gonna, going to be ordaining, but as, as I talk to some other people from other churches, it's like sort of like, huh? Laying of hands, that's a weird thing to do. Why would you do that? I don't want to be touched. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it sounds funny, but, but, the, but the New Testament example is that there is a laying of hands mm -hmm. on those men. Um, and we'll be addressing, uh, uh, we'll be looking at some of those passages later about th those things. And if similarly, um, the paragraph concludes that a similar process is for deacons. Though, you know, it is interesting, just, so just for um, a side rabbit, that uh, uh, there's no mention of fasting for deacons. Um, now, it doesn't mean you don't have to, it doesn't mean you can't fast, but it's just interesting because from, from the New Testament example, there's no mentioning of fasting when it comes to, uh, um, to the ordaining of deacons, while it does for elders. Um, that's an interesting side of rabbits. Um, any questions about paragraph nine, about the wording or something like that? Well. Yeah. This might sound dumb, but so what? What exactly does that? Sorry, this is gonna sound. No, no, go ahead. But so when you're looking for men mm -hmm. that might feel called, you're also you're looking at that they lead a life of fasting and prayer and. Oh no 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 no! Oh, did I totally miss the word? I think it means that, the, that when the church is ready to put a man into the office, yeah. there should be a time of of the church fasting. Oh. Yeah. Right. And prayer. Yeah. I'm glad I asked. I'm no, that's a, that's a good yeah, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's actually a very good question because you know historically, uh, in some churches of the past, uh, ancient and even modern, you know there there was that view that you know those who are of you know ruler who are in eldership or whatever else in the church have to be fasting. They have to be ascetic. Um, can't marry. You know all these things. Um, which can be a, a whole entire side rabbit, but um, but that's a very good question. Thanks for asking that. Now, any other questions or maybe uh, remarks or something like that? Okay. Um, so with that, we can go to the Bible <laughs> and see um, whether these things are so. The answer is yes, but uh, um, but we'll be looking at the biblical um, foundations and the biblical testimony regarding all, um, some of these points. Um, and the first passage we'll be going to is uh, Philippians chapter one, verse one. Philippians chapter one, verse one. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi 
including the overseers and deacons. Mm -hmm. So we see here that when Paul gives the greeting to the church in Philippi, he speaks to the saints who are in Christ in that church and then speaks about the overseers and deacons. Well, I'll address that a bit later. But I just, I just want to notice, in the I just want to point out the fact that Paul assumes that there is a local body of, of believers that are gathered together, that are visible, that you can say, yeah, there's the church in Philippi, not, you know, our, not a mob of believers in Philippi, but there's a local gathering. Um, I just bring that emphasis again um, because, um, as you know, um, Nick pointed out last week, um, that you know there have been Christians in the past and today. Uh, we, you know, it's at times not that hard to encounter them who say, "I don't need the church. I can um, lone wolf it. I can walk by myself." Even though the New Testament testimony is otherwise, it says that you are to gather your people to be uh, identified with a local gathering and all these things. Um, and to uh, another passage that kind of helps reinforce this idea, uh, hopefully a familiar passage, but is um, Acts chapter 1, verse 51, uh, which, um, Nick, you can read. Yes. Acts chapter 1, verse 51. Acts 1 Did I say? I was like, I don't have yeah, it. Yeah, no, I was like, Maybe you're by that. I was like, whoops. Yeah, are you reading out of Second Opinions again? Second Opinions. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I may have. Did I say 51? Yeah, you did. I was a little nervous. 15? Hold on. I think maybe. Uh, what does 15 say? In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together. Yes, okay. I just, I'm, I just had a dyslexic, dis whatever that word is. Um, I messed up my numbers, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I meant 15, Acts 115. Um, but yes, um, as Joe um, read, it's a, uh, he it notes that when it says that Peter stood up among the brothers and the company was the 120, 120. Mm -hmm. Now, let's hold that thought for a second. Let's jump up to the next chapter, chapter 2 of Acts, verse... 41, and I'm pretty sure it's 41. <laughs> uh, which, Nick, you can read. <laughs> then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is this. What were they added to? The church. The church, yeah. The church. 120. The 120, where originally there was 120. Now, you know, Luke's, Luke comments that those who baptized and believed and baptized were then added to that same body of 3,000 souls. Um, so, in, so even though, um, you know, some may say the New Testament does not give a direct explicit command at this chapter, well, this book, this chapter, this verse, this syllable, uh, that you have to join a local church, et you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever our other argumentations they may use. The assumption of the New Testament is membership of a local body in um, um, all these things. And of course, there's many other passages that we can go to, but I just, those are just, I think, kind of help at least set a starting point with that whole idea. Um, you know, if you get out of concordance or whatever else and look at um, similar Bible passages, you'll find this repeated all over the New Testament. Uh, does he not have any questions about that? About yeah. Just an observation mm -hmm. from Philippians 1. Um, I thought it was interesting how, so Paul and Timothy, they don't write a separate greeting to the overseers and deacons. It's like they're included. It's assumed that they're part mm -hmm. of membership uh -huh. in the way that that greeting is mm -hmm. formulated. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually what something I was going to address next. And it's, I'm glad you brought that up, is that... Um, to, to repeat it again, um, that when Paul and Timothy give the greeting to the Philippian ch church, they assume, they connect the overseers over, sorry, that's not my word, overseers and deacons as members of that same body. They're not some separate um, 
body of their own group of people who are, you know, over that church. But they're made up of that same body. Um, which, you know, kind of supports the Baptist ideas. No, and Presbyterian <laughs> brethren don't believe it. No, the Presbyterians wouldn't affirm that. Um, they would say that the, the uh, Presbyterians, the elders, are of their own body. Um, and all these things. And so that's a good, that's a very good uh, uh, thing that you know to just, oh. It, I might add this too. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a pastoral, this is a people epistle. Mm -hmm. uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he wrote to Titus, especially to Timothy, is very plain. But Timothy was a member of the church in Ephesus. Yep. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't writing to him disconnected from any association and accountability to a biblical local mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And plus, there's the idea that that letter would have been read publicly as well. That's right. So, like, all that Paul wrote to Timothy would have, many of the things would be just as applicable to the rest of the church, including these things, yes. the members and the elders of that, chur of that church. Yeah. Well, with that uh, uh, briefly um, addressed, we'll now finally uh, ask the question about elders. Um, you know, how many, um, you know, as, as we noted earlier with the confession, it says there's two offices, elders or bishops and deacons. And the question then becomes, okay, well, there are some today, even within Reformed Baptist circles, who say, well, there is a distinction between, um, for example, ruling elders and teaching elders. They will say that all teaching elders are ruling elders, but not all ruling elders are teaching elders that there are two distinct offices. So they have like a three office view. Um, um, there's others who teach that, you know, there's a senior pastor and then with the assistant pastors who are under them. And the senior pastor is the one who kind of, you know, leads the show. That's, that's bad phrasing because you know, church is not a show, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and all these things. Um, I mean, one question you may ask is like, who cares? You know, three offices, four offices, five offices. Why make? Why not make it ten? <laughs> keep keep raising the number up. Um, keep. Uh, but as we noted earlier, one of the main reasons why is because as um, Christ is Lord of the Church, and we want to be following the commands of Christ. We don't want to. We do not want to distort what Christ has instituted. Um, you know. You know if we. You know, you can ask. You can you can phrase it in this way. You know, if you think that we need a three office or ten office or et cetera x number office, do you think that you know better than the Lord Jesus Christ? Is is Jesus Christ? You know, is he not sufficient to show us what is necessary? Uh, what what how we need to run the church? Um, that's you know, there's a lot of other things that could be asked. Um, but uh, with that uh, briefly said, um, when we look at the New Testament, um, we see that uh, there's, com there's several terminologies used. There's, um, in the Old English, um, the word Older English, as in so of the King James, um, and translations of that era, may use, uh, translates the words such as um, pastor, or bishop, or presbyter. Um, um, in, Eng in modern English translations, um, ESV, NESB, or whatever else, it might um, it will say shepherd, shepherd. Did I say shepherd? Shepherd. Oh my goodness. Uh, shepherds or overseers and elders. Um, and these aren't, uh, you know, some people, um, you know, have at times confused this as saying believing that there are six offices. Um, <laughs> It, it may seem strange, but they have sometimes because just because you know that you know we can we just so broadly use these terminologies. At times we don't really think about what we're saying. Um, that at times for some people it has it can be confusing, like overseer, bishop, pastor, shepherd, overseer. I already said that. <laughs> um, elder, like what? What's what? I don't understand. Is it three? Is, is it three different offices? Are they all the same thing? Um, what's going on? Um, but when, when we look at the New Testament, 
words, as in like the Greek. Um, the word for pastor and shepherds is, uh, I'm going to butcher the Greek, so forgive me, anyone who, who here speaks Greek. Um, Joe, you speak Greek, right? Not really. Have at it, brother. Oh, boy. Thankfully, I'm not being graded for this, right? <laughs> no. Uh, so, the word, uh, so the word for pastor uh, or shepherd is the word um, poimen. And for bishop and overseer is episcopos or episcopos. And presbyteros is, well, kind of easy to tell, presbyter or in modern English, elders. And um, so, 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 so for simplicity's sake, you want to put it in this way, there are three descriptions of this office. First is pastor, which equals sign, shepherd. Second is a bishop, which is equal sign, overseer. And the last description is a presbyter, which equals sign, an elder. Oh. Does that make sense? Did I make it confusing? Did I just make a mess of everything? Any questions about what I said? I guess just what is the distinction between like a, an overseer and a, a pastor? Is there any difference? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, there, there are that. That is one of the questions. Be, one of the questions becomes is, um, okay, there's these descriptions, but is there an actual distinction uh, between a pastor, for example, and an overseer, or um, and all these things? And what we're gonna try to um, do over the next several passages, hopefully, is to show that all these three descriptions are talking about the same office. Uh, so to put it in practical terms, Pastor Nutter is, well, our pastor. <laughs> I just say that, I just said that. He's also our overseer, and he's also our elder. He's all three. And plus all the other, you know, small, similar descriptions that show up here and there in the New Testament. It's all regarding, it's all talking about the same office. A pastor is an elder. An elder is a pastor, uh, and an overseer is an elder, an overseer is a pastor, and you, know, you just go through the whole circle over and over again. Um, they're all talking about the same thing. Um, just focused on slight, slightly different angles. Yeah, exactly. They're look, looking at the same office through different lenses, different angles. Um, so th does that answer your question, Mitch? Sort of. Sort of, okay. As, as we look at the passages, hopefully um, it will um, give some more clarity. Um, now, why am I okay? Why am I like, you know, going through this over and over again? Um, the reason why is because even, like I said, even in Reformed Baptist circles, there are some who have, who and still do today, teach that there are distinctions between elders. That there are, like I said, ruling elders and teaching elders, or whatever else. Um, one book that I would recommend reading on about um, about elders is this book. Um, called for the audio folks, uh, in defense of parity, a presentation of the parity, or in other words, equality of <laughs> elders in the New Testament, written by Sam Waldron, Greg Nichols, James A. Hofstet Hofstetler. Did I pronounce it right? Okay. And the man who was um, the pastor of this church until he moved to Jersey, um, David Chansky. Um, and the reason why I recommend that book is because um, they address the topic about the elders, um, how the, the plurality of elders, the equality of the elders, uh, which is something we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, and one thing they also didn't do later in the second half of the book is addressing this whole question about whether there is a distinction between ruling elders and teaching elders. Because there was um, one particular well-known example of a Reformed Baptist pastor in um, Far East Asia, I forgot where. Um, I forgot, Ta not Taiwan. I think it's Singapore. Singapore, you think? Okay, somewhere around there. And he was writing books um, in opposition to what Sam Waldron and some other men teaching that there is a distinction, that there are some um, elders who are of a higher elevation of power than others. Or there are some who are simply just rulers, but there are others who rule and teach in all these things. Um, so it's important to understand what is an elder, what, you know, 
what, how to understand all these descriptions of the New Testament. Um, hopefully my uh, constant repetition of this whole thing makes it clear that it is an important question. Um, anything, um, any questions about anything I just said? Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, I saw a part in First uh, mm -hmm. Timothy chapter five verse seven when Paul <coughs> Paul was writing to Timothy. First mm -hmm. Timothy five seventeen seventeen <coughs> says, "Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor." He used the word "brave" from elders. When he was talking about there should be just one elder or two or three. Mm -hmm. I mean, this just. Just goes with what you said. Whether it should there be one priority of eldership and all that. Mm -hmm. If you use the word elder, maybe maybe Timothy and one other person, but he said the elders as a church in Ephesus when he was writing to Timothy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's other person, especially yeah. they who labor in the world, who labor in the world and <coughs> in doctrine, or the elders who labor. I just want to stress that. Thanks, Lord. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're not the teaching elder, then what are your primary? Uh, you mean like from their view? No, I mean like like in our church, if we ha if we had another elder, mm -hmm. what would his primary I don't know, job be if he's not the one who's? Well, well, the ba the confession's uh, position is that all elders are ruling te ruling elders and. Teaching elders. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Am I correct to assume that, Pastor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, could almost, you could almost word it this way. You could say, we're not just looking for a second elder. We're looking for a second pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. It would be yeah. the same and equal. As a pastor. second teacher, yeah. a second pastor overseer, etc. cetera. Pastor yeah. Mother. Right. Because right. when you look at, um, I hope I'm not still. Oh, no. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Because you look at 1 Timothy 3, mm -hmm. all elders or pastors, they all have to be able to teach. So they all need to be. So whoever, if for our church, for example, they have to meet all of the requirements of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and they have to be able to fulfill the same the same things that Pastor Nutter does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean that every elder will necessarily be preaching regularly. Yeah, and that's something I was going to address a bit later. But yeah, that's a... Uh, no, 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 it's, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so... Uh, we can go if we go back to Philippians one one. If you have, if you're already, if you left from it, uh, we see that again focusing on the second part of that verse. Paul notes that there is overseers and deacons. Paul assumes two offices. He doesn't say overseers and pastors and deacons. He simply says overseers and deacons. Or pastors or overseers and deacons and trustees. Yeah. Or trustees, yes, mm -hmm. <coughs> and that whole thing. So we see that Paul assumes a two-office position. Um, now, someone may say, well, is that it? No, there's many other passages that help us uh, see this um, clearly. Um, the next passage that we, we can look at, um, we're not going to address every single thing that's said in this passage, but we'll look at some pick out some key details, and that is 1 Timothy 3, which Joe alluded to. Uh, what verses? 1 to 13. <clears throat> this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and able teacher, not addicted to wine, not a bully, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not greedy. One who manages his own household competently, having his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders, so that he does not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with clear conscience. And they must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. 
Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons must be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when we look at this passage, we see again that Paul assumes a two office position. Verses 1 to 7 is all about the qualifications of the overseers. And verses 8 to 13 is talking about deacons. Oh. And we see when we're focusing on verses 1 to 7, we see um, a couple of things. Paul talks about, the, about these, this office, the men of this office, that they are first overseers. That's the term that he uses. They are able to teach, and they must be able to manage and lead. Um, so overseers, able to teach, and able to manage slash lead. So keep that in mind. Next passage is in Acts chapter 20, verses 17, and then verse 28. Now from Miletus... He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Mm -hmm. Now, within the context, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. And when we look at these, um, you know, there's a lot of good things said in this whole um, passage. But uh, we see a couple of key points that, he, that the passage mentions. Luke notes that these were first elders of the church. And then from there in verse 28, then he talks about how they are overseers. And then from there, that they then, what's, where's the word? I just missed it. Um, in the ESV, it says, pay careful attention to yourself, da -da -da -da, to the flock. Da -da -da. You're thinking of shepherd? Yeah. Shepherd, that's the verb form of poime. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I read it in ESV. I, I only have the ESV on this tablet. But yeah, but the word, the phrase that uh, says, pay careful attention, um, in other translations, it may say shepherding. And King James, what does it say? Which verse? 28. Take yeah, heed on yourself. Take yes. heed on yourself, okay. Yeah. In, the, in the NESB, does it say shepherding? To shepherd the church. Okay. Uh -huh. so what, Joe, what Joe read was the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, read, read the rest of the Joe. Yeah, yeah. there we go. <clears throat> uh, to, your, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Yeah, feed, there's the yeah. It's translated yeah. feed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and as Pastor noted, uh, the, the verb form that's used there is the verb form of the of shepherding. Yeah, sorry, my, my mind just blinked right there. So we see within uh, this passage, uh, there's elders, and the same, the same group of people are then called overseers, and they are called to shepherd the flock. And remember in the first... Timothy 3 passage, this group of people are called overseers. They're able to teach, and they're supposed to be able to manage and lead. Um, so we see this cross-pollination. There are the various terminologies talking about the same office. The same group of people are called elders. The same group of people are called overseers. And the same group of people are called to shepherd the flock, which means those elders are pastors. Uh, and um, they are called to able to teach and able to manage and lead. Um, and to help continue to reinforce this, uh, for Timothy, ah, did I say Timothy? I meant Titus, chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Mm -hmm. And we see that uh, within this passage, which again, a lot could be pulled out, uh, there's a couple key characteristics. Paul talks about how he left Titus um, there to appoint or ordain elders who are then called overseers. And uh, with that, they're, they're supposed to be able to instruct or able to teach. And then finally, um, two more passages. Uh, first, Tim, first Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 to 2. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for a shameful gain, but eagerly. Mm -hmm. So we see that Peter exhorts the who? Elders. The elders to shepherd the flock. And finally, the last passage. Just one more thing. Oh, yes. Exercising oversight. There's, there's the result. verb form of overseer. Yes, that's a good catch. All three yes, they're all three. Yes. Good point. I, I didn't write that. I missed that completely, honestly. <laughs> um, and finally, um, this last passage of Ephesus. Did I say, oh my. Ephesians? <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians <laughs> chapter 4, <laughs> um, verse 11. Oh boy, this is not my day. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds, and teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we're going to this passage last is because <clears throat> with, all these, with, the, with the, all the other passages that we read, we see that there is a cross-pollination, that there is a connection between overseers, elders, and pastoring. They're, they're, they're all talking about the same group of men, the same office, that the same men are overseers being able to do oversight. Over, they're supposed to be able to lead the church, manage the church, they're supposed to be able to um, shepherd, lead the flock, feed the flock, and all these things. And yet some people will go to this passage and say, there's a distinction between pastors and teachers. This is, this is where you have pastoral elders and ruling elders. Because Paul here says pastors and teachers. So they're not two different opposites, obviously. There's a catch. <laughs> um, let me uh, let ex, ex, when we look at the passage. Um, I know I didn't look at all the English translations, but I did look at the Russian translation, and it follows a similar pattern. So, <laughs> uh, and other translations um, that I did look at, like the King James, um, ESV, the Dura Reigns, even uh, <laughs> uh, NESV, and a couple other ones, and they all seem, at least from what I remember follow the same pattern. Um, when we look at verse 11, notice what Paul says. He says, the apostles, right? Does your translation say that? The apostles? No. It doesn't have the? No. It doesn't? No. What, 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 are you, what translation? He it? gave some apostles. Some apostles, okay. And some, et cetera. Okay, so it would say some right then, right? Yeah. Okay, and then, but then it says some prophets then, right? Yep. Then some evangelists, right? Yeah. Does it then say some pastors and some teachers? Or some pastors and teachers? And teachers. There's no, there's no article, there's no distinguishing, distinguishing thing of teachers. Teachers is connected with the pastors. Um, the way that um, Waldron 
he uses a big fancy phrase, I don't remember it, but he just talks about how um, another way you can translate this is he gave the pastor teachers. Mm -hmm. the, it's talking about the same office, but d distinguishing the two aspects of the office, that the same office of elders are supposed to be able to pastor the flock and to teach the flock. Um, um, when you look in the Greek, there's no chi. Um, did I say chi? There's no... Um, you did, that's the word yeah. for him. In the Jewish Bible, it just says the same. The Jewish Bible? It says, furthermore, he gives some people as emissaries, some as prophets, some as proclaim proclaimers of good news, <coughs> some as shepherds and teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes. What I meant to say, there is a chi, but what I meant... Yes. What? Yeah. I was just going to say, and when you look at the Greek, um, <laughs> yeah, it's never ending. Um, before each description, so apostles, teach, um, prophets, and etc., there's the word antus, which is the article for each of those words. And yet Paul only uses the word tus or the for pastors, and he just says and teachers. So teachers are not distinguished from pastors, they're connected grammatically in that way. <clears throat> so then what can we say in, conclu in conclusion of all these passages? Um, the short conclusion is that all pastors or all shepherds are overseers, all overseers are elders, and all elders are shepherds. They're all talking about the same office from different perspectives and different um, um, lenses of their role within the church and what they're supposed to do. So there is no uh, such thing, biblically at least, um, of, a distinguish, distinguish, uh, of, a, um, of a distinction of ruling elders and teaching elders. Because as Joe noted like 10, 100 years ago, after, me, after all my talking, uh, that Paul in 1 Timothy 3 talks about how all these, um, in order to be an elder, you had to fit, fit all, the, all these um, qualifications. And part of that is teaching. Mm -hmm. So if you're, a, you know, within that, uh, if you're a ruling elder but you're not able to teach, that's... You're a deacon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in some churches, yes, yes. <coughs> yeah. Well, yeah. deacons have to be able to rule their own household well. well yeah, that's a little bit different, though. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, in the same way that an uh, elder does. Yeah. An elder has to be able to teach. <coughs> yeah. So, does that make sense then? About um, I realize, like, I repeated a lot of a lot, some of the stuff a couple of times, but it does it at least make sense that? how elders, shepherds, and overseers is somewhat talking about the same office. Any questions or uh, maybe um, some comments or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, now there, there is a passage in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17, and 18 that has been used <laughs> by um, some. We're not going to address it right now. Um, it's something we'll kind of, we'll, I think we'll address um, next lesson um, because there's some details there that I'm going to be, pull, be pulling out at the same time. So we're going to save that for later. Um, that's the time. Okay, let's speed it up. Um, so if they're all the same position, same office, how many then? One pastor? Two pastors? Three pastors? Ten bazillion pastors? Eh. Um, um, the New Testament testimony is that it's a plurality of elders. Um, um, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, when we, I mean, just even the passages that we just read, when you look at the word elders, overseers, and etc., is it in the singular or in the plural? Plural. plural. Every single time, it's in the plural. Um, and uh, there's a lot of passages I've listed here that reinforce this. We're not going to touch them all, but there's one passage that helps um, bring this out one more time is in Acts 14, 24, which, oh, it's my turn. <laughs> um, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so Acts 14, 24, um, it says this. Did I say 24? I meant, yeah. I meant 23. Uh, <laughs> I again messed up in that first number. Uh, and when they, talking about Paul and Barnabas, uh, and, well, I'll get to that later. And when they had appointed the elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So we see even from the apostolic example of Paul, um, they, they appointed elders um, within um, that church, that area. Um, you know, who's gonna, and who is going to argue against apostolic example? No one. Okay. <laughs> um, and then there's also then the passage. I'll just read it real quick. Um, in Hebrews 13, 17, where the Apostle Paul um, says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Um, and, you know, I believe that Paul here is talking about the elders, talking about that they are the leaders, and submitting to them, obeying, obeying them. And notice how he says leaders. Not leader, but leaders. Plural. Um, and of course, you know, there's all the other passages we, we already read before and other passages in the New Testament that point out this reality. It's a plurality of elders. That is a norm. Um, and, I emphasize, and I emphasize that. That is the norm. Um, the reality is that because of, you know, situations, including ours, you know, that sometimes just, just hasn't happened. Um, and even when the 1689 was formed, and in 89 publicly uh, um, formalized um, by 100 churches, and et cetera, many of those churches didn't have a plurality of elders, even though they knew that that's the right thing to do. Uh, because of the situation in the, in, in, the, in the English time period there, they didn't have a plurality of elders um, in some of those churches. Um, now, they were, now, they were exhorted to, you know, when you can, when you find a man to appoint, to appoint him to the office, don't delay. But um, that was just the reality. Even the, the Baptists who formed the confession recognized they faced that reality, just like just as, you know, churches today, including ours do today. Um, and it's not, and it's, you know, I would say, uh, I would say this as well. It is not necess it is not, um, if I'm, if I, if, if I, if I, if I, if I am about to say is wrong, cut it out from the tape. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, our church is not in sin for having only one elder. And the reason for that is because we just haven't found um, another man who, uh, um, where all the people see that we should have this man as an elder. God hasn't uh, brought that, um, or at least hasn't um, opened our, all of our eyes to see that man. And it may be that God is still developing that man in our church or in another place that he's going to be bringing here and all these things. Now what, now, what is sinful, one second, sorry, no, no. is when a church um, refuses to have another elder, which clearly from our prayer uh, <laughs> list, that's not the case. We want one. Uh, Pastor Nutter wants another elder. So like, it is our desire. We're not in sin because we only have, only have one elder. I want to emphasize that because that, that's a, that is a question that can come up. Like, are we in sin then? <laughs> and all these things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jess, you wanted to say something? I was just going to say the, the alternative would be, you know, appointing someone before they're ready or yeah. like Pastor Steve taking executive action um, to appoint someone. Mm -hmm. Which? It would, it would go against other, other parts of chapter 26. Yep. <laughs> you have to have. And our, our confession does say it has to be by the uh, common the suffrage of the church. Right. That as well. So the, the, church, yeah, to, right. the church has to recognize the man. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the way which we believe God is calling the man. Yep. Calling him through the affirmation of the church. That's why we have an advi advisory nomination <coughs> ballot that I, I take every year at the annual business meeting. 
It also mm -hmm. says, well, in which if you see a man or men that are gifted in grace for the office of elder or deacon, that you have an opportunity to say, Pastor, I think God's hand might be on this man or on that man for this office or that office. But it also says within the Constitution, if you see God raising up such a man, you don't have to wait to the annual business meeting. Go to the pastor and talk with him about it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Now, uh, we're not going to touch all the details of what exactly a shepherd, overseer, and elder does. We're going to be touching that next lesson in paragraphs 10 and, um, and all of these things. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to focus more on the reality that these, these are all the same office. Sort of emphasis on that. Now, we will be returning to these, returning to these passages next week. Um, 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 there's something else I wanted to say about the plurality of elders. I'm trying to remember. If I remember, I'll just say it later. Then I'm not, not going to wander around. Um, so anyone have any um, else to say or maybe questions? or? Well, I guess one thing we could point out with plurality, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that every elder has to be fully supported. Oh, I yes. Mean, that might, maybe you want to comment on that, Danny. Well, that, that's, I was going to address it in paragraph 10, but... Uh, because yeah. that's brought up there, right. but uh, but yes, it doesn't mean that um, every every elder has to be um, fully uh, financially supported um, by the church. Um, having a bi-vocational, or in other words, a man who is an elder but also doing work, we can call secular work, um, is perfectly fine. It's not a sin. Um, and I mean, and, and you know, the reality is that um, you know, there's you know churches where they can't fully support the pastor uh, because they're in a poor area where he knows and they just they can do as much as they can to try to support the man you know maybe some money here and there but the man just has to be able to work um, on the side as well oh. and uh, having brought that up I can remember what I was going to say uh, when we talk about the plurality of elders as um, Pastor Nutter also touched on earlier that it does not mean that every single elder um, preaches um, in the, the same amount, teaches the same amount in all these things. Um, the biblical, the Bible recognizes and um, church life recognizes that different men have different gifts. Um, some men are more uh, apt to teach in a very clear in way that er, like, just like everyone's just blown away. Um, of, some men have a gift of preaching. Their voice is um, their whole um, rhetoric, just the, the whole preaching, uh, they are so full of spirit and life uh, in a way that, you know, some, someone else may not have to the same degree. Uh, to, put it, to, put another, to put it another way, a Charles Spurgeon only comes once in a, um, I was going to say a million years, uh, but, uh, but it only comes one, only, not, it's a rare thing for uh, a Spurgeon to come around. Um, and when, when you think about it, uh, how many Charles Spurgeons have there been in history? One, right? How many uh, Augustans have there been in history? Augustan of Hippo. Not the order. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, only one, right? How many Luthers have there been? Martin Luther, oh. one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, how many John Calvins have there been? One. Um, but yet, when we think about it, there have been thousands and thousands of many other elders, pa um, teachers, and pastors, and et cetera, all the other terminologies, um, who have you know, done their work in the church. We don't know anything about them. You know, they're lost to, quote unquote, lost to history. God knows them, even though we may not know them by name. Um, and yet, God used them to continue the church. Um, you know, it isn't. It isn't um, to put, it in different, to put it in another way, it isn't just the John Calvins who helped lead the church. It is all the men who saw the same theology and agreed and continued the same work, even though we may not, not know a single detail about them. It's been lost to history. God used them in their degree, even though their fame is small, even though they may not have the same um, rhetorical skills or anything like that, yet God used them all. So only because there's a difference uh, in degrees of um, certain gifts doesn't mean one elder um, is somehow lower in status than another. They're all um, equal, parity. They have the same authority, even though they may have a diversity of gifts.
which they may uh, then focus on some area more than another elder. Uh, do you want to add something to that, uh, Pastor, or? Um, no, that, that's well said. Okay, I'm just making sure. God gives different uh, gifts and opportunities. And yeah. Uh, but I would say this regarding apt to teach. A man has to have a modicum of ability mm -hmm. to communicate unto edification divine truth to hearers. Sometimes that might more take the shape of counseling across you know, a desk rather than preaching from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. But I would say that he has to have some ability from the pulpit to communicate divine truth to the benefit of God's people. Mm -hmm. And would you say that every um, elder should be able to preach as well? Every elder should be able to preach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, yeah, but I would say with at least a modicum of ability yeah. to, to bless his hearers. Mm -hmm. was, was that why Paul was telling Timothy to let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the world and doctrine. Yeah, he's, he's saying that these men have particular ability ab above the ones that they have parity with to communicate on the edification the truth of God. Mm -hmm. And it's evident. Mm -hmm. yep. they're, they're equal in their authority, but they're not equal in their gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, again, plug in. In Defense of Parity. A uh, good book that addresses this whole subject as well. Um, well, with that said, we'll quickly address deacons. Um, um, so, as we, uh, well, hmm, 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 hmm. there's a lot that could be said. Uh, I just need to make sure I don't uh, go way over time. <coughs> Um, when we go back to 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13, we see that there are several qualifications given. Um, hmm, should I just go over the qualifications right now? or I'll get to that in a second. And that um, one of the questions becomes is what is the role, you know, okay, well, what's the difference between a deacon and an elder? You know, is, it, is a deacon just simply um, an elder who doesn't teach? But still rules, um, as it is in, has been practiced in some churches. Or is a deacon something else? Is um, and that's an important question. And the one one passage that really helps give clarity to um, this whole subject um, is Acts chapter six. Yeah, sorry, I know, I know, I made you guys go to First Timothy three. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll go to Acts 6 first. Verses 1 to 7. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called a multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timor, and Parmenas and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great multitude of the priests were obedient to the faith. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when we look at what's, being, what's going on here, we see the problem is that, uh, you know, there's, there's um, these complaints, there's um, infighting between different groups within the Christian church, and the apostles recognize that they, they can't, um, you know, focus on some of these administrative duties and focus on their ministry of the word and all these things at the same time. There's, that's a great, um, great, uh, great uh, way to bear all together, and that they institute, uh, well, we would, even though the word deacon isn't here, they uh, 
oh, that's um, part of the role of a deacon is here. Is what, I forgot the exact word I wanted to use. But, um, and we see that, um, that deacons, what's the, sorry, my head is just twisted right there. Um, right. Um, let's take a step back. Sorry, I know I'm just messed that up a little bit. But uh, who in here knows what the word deacon means? Servants. Uh, in, in the, in the it, it, etymological root, blah, 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 et cetera, all that fancy stuff. Uh, it has the idea of a servant uh, who's, you know, beside the table and helps out, you know, here, like, you know, passing things out and all these things. They're not, they're not the lord of the, of the table. They're the helper of the table. And uh, that's, that, that's very important because we see that um, when the apostles uh, picked out these seven men, it was so that they are to serve the tables. Um, and that um, in 1 Timothy 3, uh, we don't have to go to it, but um, one thing that is not within the qualification of deacons is the ability to teach. Whereas for elders or called, they're said you have to be able to teach. That's not one of the qualifications for a deacon. Um, because the role of the deacon is not to be an elder. It is to serve in the church in a special manner um, where it, it is needed. Um, and that can be through, um, you know, if there is a outward ministry of some kind that the church can appoint deacons to able to work in those ministries so that um, the pastors who can still participate in those things can still then focus on their uh, ministry of the word in all these things. Yeah, it's important that we see that serving tables is not beneath their dignity. dignity. Mm -hmm. It's just not part of their job description. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, serving tables, the, the word for serve there, we also find it down in verse 4, but we that the, the elders of the church, the apostles at this point, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It could also be translated service of the word. Our service is in this area. Mm -hmm. Their service is in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's very important because, you know, it, again, I'm, I'm, to use personal experience, which I mean, you have to be careful with, but I mean, and when I talk to other people, you know, it, it has someone, I think it was Jess who joked about it, or, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes, and sadly in, in modern evangelicalism, um, deacons have the power of rule. Of, um, there's a board of trustees of um, deacons who can vote and outvote the elders. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, if the elders want to change something in the Constitution or change something within the church, the deacons can outvote them um, within their own board. Um, which biblically, deacons don't have that. There's no, there's no board of deacons or anything like that. As in, like a their own separate organization that has um, power over the church. Now, in one sense, this is where it kind of gets very nuanced. In one sense, deacons do have authority because it is given to them by the elders in the church, but it is a limited authority. It's not an authority of rule, but authority of service, service, service ship. That's not the right word, but um, in these things. Now, this does not mean deacons can't teach because Philip, later on, when you read Acts, goes on to teach. Stephen went on to teach. So it doesn't mean deacons can't teach, but their teaching ability is not because they are deacons, but it is um, their um, role of teaching is outside of their role of, of being a deacon. And that must be distinguished. So, you know, Hoochie, he can preach, he can teach, which he has been doing, <laughs> which is good and biblical. It's perfectly fine and all these things. Um, so, um, there's more that could be said, uh, but for the sake of time, I'll ask. Does that make sense then, the distinguishing differences between deacons and elders? A lot more could be said, but at least that. The elders are the ones, are, 
you know, the leaders, the rulers, the overseers, and et cetera. But deacons, well, they do service in the, chur in the church, and that's not, be that's not, you know, somehow a lower status. You know, serving the church is a great blessing. Right. Much, there's much hardship, but it's a great blessing. Um, but only because they don't have the ability to rule, like elders do, doesn't mean they're somehow lesser now. No. No, Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're following their master. Yeah. <clears throat> um, does anyone have any questions or um, anything like that? Okay. I have one question. Because <laughs> we already are 20 minutes over, over time. Um, we can stop here right now and just go eat and we can just continue the rest of the thing next week. Or we can just finish up about women. Female uh, being elders and deacons. You want to open that can of worms at this mm -hmm. link? <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want to teach till midnight? <laughs> <laughs> can of worms before dinner. <laughs> um. <laughs> so are you taking a vote? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you guys. You get, do you guys want to just quickly touch that, or you guys want to save for next time? <laughs> I just, I don't, I just don't want to. What did you say? <laughs> you said we don't get touched. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do. Uh, yeah, we should do it. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you're John. Yeah. John, does John? Okay. No, I, I would like it. I think it would be wisest when, when we have the better part of our brains yeah. to, to consider this volatile subject on a different day. I, I, I agree. Do you go over it later, though? I, I, I mean, I think, I, I think it's probably better just to address the stuff next week. I mean, and that's why I'm, that one's just, I'm just asking, just in case just maybe someone wanted to touch it. But I, I think I it's mean, better just to leave it next time. To bring that out in some level of detail, to uh -huh. that's even if you need to take an extra week to do that. I think I think I think it's a rather simple subject, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> no, I mean biblically, it's pretty simple. No, I mean no, practice, no. practice, and pragmatism is a different question. Yes, but biblically, it's rather simple. Very, very clear. Right? Paul was speaking to that culture, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. They're arguing that Paul was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a culture. Yeah. 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 Well then, with that, um, the the uh, the unofficial congregation has voted. <laughs> we shall. Huh? Suffrage. <laughs> suffrage, yes. Yeah. By common suffrage, we shall, <laughs> we shall uh, continue th this next weeketh. <laughs> week um, so then, um, next week, then we'll just talk about the subject of women be being elders or deacons, or the lack thereof. Um, and then from there, um, the qualifications of elders and deacons, and then their ministry. Um, their purpose, their role in the church, which we, in one sense we already did touch, but just more some specifics. Um, so that'll be that. Um, before we pray, I, I know I already asked, but anyone have any questions, concerns, or maybe a thought, like, huh, I never knew that, or maybe um, something like that. Or maybe like a question that I didn't answer, but it's in your head that I should probably go into next week, besides the question about females, pastors, and stuff like that. I think I'd be prepared to answer the arguments of the egalitarians. Okay. <laughs> well then, um, shall we also pray for food? Are we going to be eating here or? Yep. Okay. Plenty of food. So. Plenty of food. Okay. Well then, um, I guess I'll just close the prayer then. Oh Lord God, I thank you that we can have this uh, blessed Lord's Day where we can gather as your people, and that we can also have the study of your word about how your church looks like. And Lord, we live in an age, just like many uh, of the other years throughout the church, of the church history, where there is uh, much distortion of what it means to be an elder, what it means to be a deacon, and all these things. There's much confusion at times. And Lord, 
And even some of us here come from backgrounds where these confusions existed. And I pray and ask, Lord, that you may, uh, th through this and through further studies and uh, fur further things, that you may help us to have further and further clarification and uh, knowledge of what it means to be an elder, uh, of what is a deacon, their roles in the church, and how it is all for the edification and building up the, of the church. And that uh, we may obey your word, Lord, that we may not distort it, that we may not go beyond what you, what you have said and laid out in your word, and that you may help us to even examine our own church, our own selves, that um, if there is an area of pragmatism, an area where maybe we could be, uh, use correction, whatever it, could, whatever it is, Lord, if there is something, that you may help us to see it in due time, and, th and that by coming suffrage to be able to uh, deal with these issues. And I ask and pray they may bless the food, that it may be a nourishment to our bodies, just as the preaching has been a nourishment to our souls. And we ask and pray, in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.